Hey everyone, my name is Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. I'm back with another true crime story to lull you to sleep or perhaps to give you nightmares. Stephen Clark was a 23-year-old young man from Colchester, Essex in England. When he was just three years old, he had been hit by a truck, rendering him permanently disabled. On December 28th, 1992, Stephen spent the afternoon with his mother walking on the beach located near their home in Saltburn, England. At around 3 p.m., they went to use the public toilets, each entering a separate stall. Stephen's mother finished up, and then she waited around for her son to come out, but when he didn't come out, she assumed that he must have finished before her and headed home already. So she decided to walk back. She arrived home expecting to find Stephen already there but he wasn't. This would spark a decades-long investigation to determine what happened to Stephen Clark that fateful day. Did he encounter a stranger? Was he met with foul play? At one point, the police even believed that his elderly parents could be responsible for his disappearance. Over 30 years later, Stephen Clark's case remains a mystery. So let's jump right in. It was 1969, and Doris Clark, she was about to experience a parent's worst nightmare. The young mother decided to go out to do a bit of shopping that day. When she left the house, she had no idea that her toddler son, Stephen, who was maybe two or three years old at the time, had decided to follow her out the front door. It wasn't until little Stephen wandered out into the road and was hit by a truck that she realized what had happened in those few short moments. At first, no one even thought that Stephen would live, but after spending a month in a coma, he proved the doctors wrong and he pulled through. Still, doctors believed that he'd likely never walk or talk or have any kind of quality of life but he would prove them wrong. Yes, the damage had been done, and Stephen would be left permanently disabled, unable to use his left arm, and having to walk with a limp. But he did walk, and he did talk, and he achieved so much more than the doctors believed that he would. His mother, Doris, would say, quote, It must have been very hard for him. He was so different from the little boy before the accident to how he was when he came home. So we just worked as hard as we could to get him better. Despite his disability, Stephen has been described as one of the happiest and most hardworking people out there. He really thrived and he excelled in ways that many thought would be impossible, even earning the title Apprentice of the Year. After finishing with school, he very much wanted to work and contribute to society by getting a job, so he attended the Rathbone Society, an organization that connects disabled people with employers. But still, he really struggled to find a job due to his disability. And yet, he never lost his sense of humor and his positive disposition. He was really close to both of his parents, Charles and Doris, as well as his sister, Victoria, who tried to protect him from public scrutiny as much as she could. Victoria would later recall how, as a child, she would walk ahead of her brother and act out loud and silly, sticking her tongue out in an attempt to draw attention to herself and away from her brother, who walked with a limp. Kids were not kind back then. Neither were adults. Of her brother, she would say, quote, he had a great sense of humor, an infectious laugh. You couldn't help but laugh when being around him. When Stephen wasn't spending time with his family, he enjoyed listening to music and playing his euphonium, which is an instrument similar to that of a trombone. I had to Google what it was because I had no idea. He was also an excellent swimmer, and he was a total computer geek. He knew everything that there was to know about computers and IT in general. Stephen had recently found a new girlfriend, a young lady that he had met in a pub. The pair had been on several dates at the pub, and it was still a new relationship, but he was really happy and excited about it. All this to say, Stephen, he was a very special and loved young man which makes his disappearance all the more devastating for his family, who just want answers. 
but after 31 years, there are none to be found. So let's talk about the day that Stephen Clark went missing. It was December 28th, 1992, a beautiful sunny day, but just a little bit chilly. The plan initially was for Stephen to go watch a football game with his dad, Charles. However, Stephen changed his mind about going when he learned that he'd actually have to pay for the ticket himself. It was kind of a running joke that Stephen never really wanted to use his own cash. But instead, Charles would go to the hockey game alone, and Stephen would decide to spend the day with his mother, Doris. They decided to walk to the beach in Saltburn, which would have been about a 45-minute walk from their home. They arrived, it went great, and before making their way back home, they had to use the bathroom, so they made a stop at the public toilets. Stephen went into the men's washroom while his mother, Doris, went into the women's bathroom. When Doris was finished, she exited the bathroom and she stood outside waiting for her son to come out. She would later recall that it was fairly busy that day, but the only people that she really noticed at the time were two men with a little girl, with each of the men taking a turn to use the bathroom while the other one waited with the little girl. Doris stood around the bathroom for quite a while, expecting Stephen to come out of the washroom anytime. She waited and she waited and no Stephen. So when he hadn't come out, she assumed that he had already begun to walk towards home. So she also started walking back home, believing that she would meet him there. Now, some people have questioned why she went home instead of checking the bathroom for Stephen. But in Doris's own words, she said, quote, he would have been horrified. He was 23, not a child which I think is really important to remember here. It's all too easy and very common to infantilize adults with disabilities. But he was a grown man with his own autonomy. He could take care of his own basic needs. His mother and his father, they had always treated him like the grown man that he was. So they weren't going to barge in on him in the bathroom. Doris likely regrets that decision now, but hindsight is twenty twenty. When she arrived back at home, Stephen wasn't there, and that is when she really began to worry. She waited for her husband, Charles, to return from watching the football match, and together they went to search for their son, Stephen. They thought that he must have gone for a walk along the beach, but the tide, it was already high. When they checked all of the places that they thought he could possibly be with no sign of Stephen, they called the police to report him as missing. When his sister Victoria learned that her brother was missing, she got on the next train ride home to help look for him. Police would do their own search for Stephen, but unfortunately, they also didn't find any sign of him anywhere. There would, however, be two unconfirmed reported sightings of Stephen by people who actually knew him, which obviously makes these sightings a lot more reliable than if he was seen by some random person who only knew him from a picture. The first reported sighting happened just a few days after Stephen was reported missing on December 30th, 1992. A man by the name of Mr. Stan Kamish reported seeing Stephen in the town of Redcar, which wasn't too far away from where he lived, at around 2 p.m. in the afternoon on December 30th. He claimed to have seen Stephen walking by himself down the road towards town. Now at the time, this witness was in deep conversation with a friend, so he didn't have a chance to say hello to Stephen or even to catch his gaze, but he did say that he was sure it was him. This reported sighting slightly changed when the police later interviewed him about what he saw. During that discussion, Mr. Kamish, he said he saw a male that walked similar to Stephen with that limp, but he couldn't see the man's face from where he stood about 30 yards away, so he couldn't be sure that it actually was Stephen. Complete contradiction to what he initially said. The next time a witness claims to have seen Stephen was on January 14th, a little over two weeks after he was reported missing. An unnamed woman reported seeing Stephen at around 5 p.m. that day as she was looking out of her window. She claimed that he was with another man who appeared to be around 50 or 60 years old, medium build with gray hair and glasses. 
According to the report, she saw the two men walking toward Glenside Terrace in Saltburn, and it looked like Stephen was trying to keep up with the other man walking. This woman saw the news report that Stephen was missing, and she recognized his photo because she had a family member who worked at the same bowling club that Stephen and his family attended. Even though this woman said that she was sure it was Stephen, police noted that the distance from her window where she said she saw him from to where she actually said she saw Stephen, it was a really great distance and it would have been dark at the time that she would have saw him. So it would be really difficult to positively identify someone that way. So again, this sighting, it could not be verified. And beyond these two sightings, there weren't any witnesses to anything. No one who was at the washroom that day would come forward with information. And there wasn't any indication of where he may have gone or what happened to him. There was no trail, no evidence, no confirmed sightings. And the case, it went cold for years. Then, on September 24th, 1999, the local police station received an anonymous letter referencing Stephen's disappearance. The contents of the letter have never been made public, but Detective Chief Inspector Sean Page would say, The letter is very precise in nature. The letter writer intimated that Stephen was dead and that they claim to know the person responsible. One might infer that the letter pointed a finger directly at Stephen's aging parents, Doris and Charles, because the police, well, they went to their home to interview them about his death and probable murder. Eventually, the couple, Doris and Charles, they would be arrested on suspicion of murder of their son. In the eyes of investigators, there was no reason to believe that Stephen was still alive. At this point, he had been missing for around eight years, with no confirmed sightings of him. He left behind all of his belongings, including his wallet and his eyeglasses, and he never came back to collect on that cash reward that he had won as part of an apprenticeship. So they didn't believe that he had just left of his own free will, and they didn't believe that he was still alive. The police were now squarely focused in on Charles and Doris, who were now in their 80s as suspects in their son's murder. The couple, who were both former police officers, would be interrogated over what they knew. Doris was questioned over her decision to leave the washroom without checking for her son first. And, I mean, it is a fair question. Even if she didn't want to barge in on her adult son, it's kind of surprising that she didn't at least go to the entrance of the washroom and call out his name just to ensure that he was okay. He did have mobility issues, so, I mean, he could have fallen. I'm sure that it's a decision that she would forever regret, but she says that she truly believes her son headed home alone. She was also questioned about her husband, Charles, and whether he had the capacity to be violent. And police, they pressured her to tell them where the body was so that they could lay Stephen to rest. But both Doris and Charles have always denied knowing anything about their son's disappearance. The police, they would tear up the family home, including the yard and especially the garden, looking for any clues that could connect Charles and Doris to their son's disappearance and likely death. But they found nothing. Eventually, investigators were also able to track down the person who mailed that anonymous letter to ask them how they came about the information. But the letter sender, they didn't have any proof to back up any of their claims. Basically, these were accusations and they were based on a feeling. This person didn't have any personal knowledge of the family. For these reasons, the charges against Charles and Doris were dismissed but the effects of their arrest, they have been long-lasting. Their impeccable reputations as former police officers and leaders in their community was tarnished as people began to question their story and their involvement in Stephen's case. I don't, oh. I don't know. I suppose we're fairly laid back as a couple. Um, but when they, they rang the doorbell and I opened the door, it was it's only 8 o'clock in the morning. They came without any warning whatsoever and uh, asked where Charles was. And I said, well, he's in the shower. And so I had to call him down. 
and she came down and again we were cautioned and told that we were being arrested for the murder of Stephen Clark. Well, I, I, I oh, think I terrible. gave a, a laugh, you know, a sort of nervous laugh, because mm. I, I couldn't believe it. Well, the... Um... I mean, we were, it was shocking that particular mm. time. Mm. I mean, we'd spent 28 years trying to get the police involved. Right. And they never, hardly ever, they'd, every, every year they would appear and say, how is Stephen, where is he, and all the rest of it. Stephen's sister, Victoria, also came to the defense of her parents. She would appear on the podcast called The Missing to share her side of the story. She criticized the actions of the police, putting her aging parents through such a horrific ordeal, all because of an anonymous letter that made unsubstantiated claims against them. She says her parents, they are victims missing their son, and being implicated in his disappearance, it re-traumatized them. She would say, quote, Our relationship as a family was love-filled. Stephen and I couldn't have wished for a happier childhood. Stephen going missing has been a living nightmare for all of us. At the time when Stephen went missing, the police did very little to support us. To put us through this trauma instead of focusing on finding Stephen has been extremely damaging and a total misuse of resource. So if his family didn't have anything to do with his disappearance, then what happened to Stephen Clark? Another leading theory is that maybe he did actually try to walk home on his own and fell off the side of the cliff that leads back to his house. But some professionals, they don't think that that's possible because his body, it would have been found by now. The biggest problem in this case is the pure lack of evidence or credible witnesses. There just isn't any evidence to point towards whether he ran away to start a new life, he was murdered, or just abducted. While the police believe that he is likely dead at this point, his family still has hope that he's out there alive somewhere. If he were still alive today, after missing for 31 years, he would be 54 years old. No one other than Stephen's parents have ever been implicated in his disappearance and suspected murder. Crime Stoppers have issued a £10,000 reward for any information that leads to the discovery of what happened to Stephen Clark. And so now, I turn the question over to you. What do you think could have happened to Stephen Clark? Is it possible that he is out there still somewhere, still alive, maybe with a new life? Or do you think that he was met with foul play? Maybe he did try walking home alone and then something happened to him. Someone lured him away or he had some kind of accident due to his mobility issues. You'll have to let me know what you think because as of recording, this is still an unsolved cold case. That's it for me tonight. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. Did you know I also have a Serial Napper True Crime Discussion Group? It's called Serial Society, and I'll have the link in my show notes. I would love to chat with you about all of the cases that I cover and everything else true crime. You can find my audio on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. I post all of my episodes in video format over on YouTube, so check it out. And if you're watching on YouTube, I would love if you can give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I'm over on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Serial underscore Napper, and I post things on TikTok, Serial Napper Nick, and that's all one word. Until next time, sweet dreams, stay kind, especially in the comments. Bye.